So <clears throat> my, my title is The Place of the Self in Contemporary Metaphysics. And <clears throat> by contemporary metaphysics, I mean analytic metaphysics of the sort that's pursued in kind of top American and British <clears throat> universities in the early 20th century. And the kind of general question I'm interested in is, is contemporary metaphysics hospitable or hostile to the self? I think in one respect, contemporary analytic metaphysics is hostile to, certainly to some very grand claims which have been made about, about the self. For example, in the 19th century, we found <coughs> uh, a kind of idealist trend in, in philosophy where in some sense the self was the fundamental ground of the whole empirical world. And I think <coughs> it's fair to say that contemporary metaphysics is characterized by a very realist outlook, according to which the self, if it's anything at all, is just one thing among many others in a world which is in fact largely, completely independent of our minds. So certainly the self has been demoted from the kind of very grand place it occupied in, uh, <clears throat> in the idealist theories of, you know, from late 18th into early 20th century. But I want to explore the question whether some trends in contemporary analytic metaphysics are hostile in a more worrying way to certain claims we'd like to make about, about the self. So I think it's, it's nice to <clears throat> begin with a contrast which Wilfred Sellers famously drew between the manifest image of man in the world and the scientific image. So the manifest image is roughly the image of the world we get by, as it were, taking naive appearances at, at face value. Right, just the, the manifest, kind of common sense, ordinary picture of the world. The scientific image is the image we get from, well, <clears throat> it's the image that science, particularly science, which <clears throat> postulates unobservable theoretical entities, the picture that <clears throat> science gives us. And I mean, since the modern, well, throughout the modern age, there's been a kind of question whether, and if so, how the manifest image and the scientific image can be, uh, as Salas put it, unified into a single, a single vision. I mean, a classic examples of this general problem include, for example, the question of colour. So perhaps it's part of the manifest image of the world that we're surrounded by <coughs> objects which have you know, objective colours on their surfaces. But then the scientific image maybe tells us that really all that's out there is kind of colourless atoms in a void. How can we reconcile the manifest and scientific image in that case? Another classic case would be Arthur Eddington's two tables, right? So the table I see here appears to be sort of manifestly a solid, homogenous thing. But hang on, science tells us that really material objects like this are you know, mostly empty space and they're not, they're not solid uh, at all. <clears throat> so I want to ask the question whether there's a conflict between the manifest image and the scientific image in the case of the self. Okay, so that's, that's my, my question. And I think some trends in contemporary metaphysics suggest that there is a problem here reconciling the manifest and scientific image of the self. So, well, first question, what, what, is, what is the manifest image of the self? And by self, I'm, I'm talking about the, hu the human self, whatever that is. So, I am an example of that kind of thing, I guess. You, you guys are as well. So, the, the human self is just the sort of thing I am. <clears throat> And I think, well, it's a difficult question, what is the, the manifest image of the human self? Maybe there are lots and lots of aspects 
But I think minimally, here are two components of the manifest image of the self. First, there is at least one human self here. Right here, I'm, I'm pointing at this, this region of space. Right? There's at least one human self right here. So I've called that claim, <clears throat> on the hand, out existence. Second claim I'm calling sparseness. So that's the claim that there's not more than one human self here. Okay, it seems to me this is part of how things naively seem to us about human selves. They're, they exist and they're, they're fairly sparse. Right? There's, just, there's no more than one here, but there's at least one here. Okay, so that's, those are the two claims I'm going to take to be part of the manifest image of the self. <clears throat> What's the scientific image of the self? Well, on the handout, I've, I've put some, some claims. So first, claim one is just kind of definitional. Right? So composite. <clears throat> a composite is a thing fundamentally characterized in terms of its parts. Second claim, which I think is, you know, su suggested by our scientific picture of the world, ordinary macroscopic material objects, right, things like tables, chairs, trees, cats, people, <coughs> are just com composites. Okay, they're, <coughs> they're composites of parts arranged cat-wise or tree-wise or... <coughs> table-wise. Next claim, the human self is an ordinary macroscopic material object. So, a human self is a composite of parts arranged in a certain way, right? human-wise arranged. So there's, you know, little fundamentally, ultimately, it just little quarks and electrons and things. They're all arranged in a, a big human-shaped kind of cloud. <clears throat> okay, so that, that I'm going to take it as the kind of part of the, the scientific image of the human self, where human selves are just physical objects and physical objects are just composites of little parts. <clears throat> now I think a couple of claims taken very seriously in contemporary analytic metaphysics generate problems, complementary problems for the existence strand of our manifest image of ourselves and the sparseness strand. <clears throat> so there's a view which um, Ted Sider, NYU, Kian Dor, Oxford Stroke, NYU, and some others have held, <clears throat> and this is what I've called compositional nihilism. This is N on the handout. There is no such relation as parthood. Okay, the word part is a kind of empty, failed, natural kind term, if you like, like phlogiston or elan vital or absolute rest, or it's one of these things which has turned out not to exist, really. Well, <clears throat> so that's, that's the compositional nihilist view. There's no such thing as, as parthood. Claim five, well, if there's no such thing as parthood, then are, there are no composites. So after all, a composite is just, if it's anything, is a thing fundamentally characterized by its parts. So if there's no such thing as parthood, and we've agreed that human selves are just composites, if they exist at all, then <clears throat> it follows there are no human selves. So that's a, that's a striking conflict with the manifest image we have of, well, of, of ourselves. There is, there is no self. Okay, and we get a, a kind of complementary challenge the manifest image from another view taken very seriously. Actually, a, you know, a, a, 
uh, an opposing view, but taken very seriously in analytic metaphysics, which I've called abundance. And we find this view um, in Quine, Lewis, Yablo, Kit Fine, John Hawthorne. These are, these are big names in analytic metaphysics. And this is the claim that for any region of space-time filled with elementary objects, there is a composite occupying exactly that region with those objects as its parts. Okay, so <clears throat> there are lots and lots of composites. That's why it's called abundance, right? Wherever you've got some things, there's a thing which is made up of those things, occupying the, the place where those things are, okay, having those things as parts. <clears throat> so the difficulty for the manifest image then is this. So there are in fact, and here's, here's where my drawing comes to life. <clears throat> so this is eight on the handout. There are many slightly different overlapping regions of space-time filled with elementary objects arranged human-wise right here, actually. So, so here's, here's a picture of all the elementary little things right here. Well, you know, there are kind of fuzzy edges to something like <clears throat> the cloud of atoms here. So actually there are lots and lots of slightly different regions of space containing <coughs> elementary particles arranged <coughs> human-wise, right? That this one includes this, this one includes this particle, this one doesn't. So actually, there are going to be probably millions of slightly different composites right here arranged human-wise, okay? And we also, you know, that's one way of generating these lots of things, but, you know, there's also something that's right here, which is um, exactly the same shape as a, as a human who's had their leg amputated, right? Just extends down to, down to here. And then there's one also here that includes this slightly smaller set of particles. So, you know, you keep doing this and you realise there are many, many composites of elementary things arranged human-wise right here. <clears throat> but now, according to the scientific image of the human self, the claim, the claim four I arrived at, <clears throat> a human self just is a composite of elementary particles arranged human-wise. So if there's lots and lots of composites of elementary particles arranged human-wise, there are lots and lots of human selves right here. There are billions of them. Okay, so there's, <clears throat> there's the conflict with what I called sparseness, right? The claim there's just, there's no more than one human self here. <clears throat> so the nihilist view about composition leads to the claim that, well, we don't exist. The abundant view of composition leads to the view that there are many, many human selves right here. So either way, we get a, a kind of conflict with our manifest image of, of ourselves. So can we, can we save the manifest image of the self in the, in the face of these, these two challenges? Well, I think one way to go would be to deny claim three. So claim three said, a human self is just an ordinary macroscopic material object. <clears throat> And well, how might that go? Well, one idea would be, well, the self is not a material object, but an immaterial object. Right? That'd be the kind of dualist position. A self is just, is not a material thing at all, but an immaterial soul or, or spirit. <clears throat> Another way to go would be to say, well, the human self is some kind of material object, but a 
a kind of material object of a very different category from ordinary things like trees and cats and tables and, and the rest of it. <clears throat> so I'm not going to say anything against those options. I'll just tell you that I'm myself attracted to the kind of view which Eric Olson described a couple of weeks ago, the, the animalist view that human selves just are a certain kind of ordinary macroscopic object, uh, quite a lot like a cat, but not, not a cat, but a, a homo sapiens, right? Not a, not a feline, but a, you know, a hominid. <clears throat> so I think the human self is just an ordinary material object of a certain sort, not categorically different from things like cats and trees. So that's not, <clears throat> that's not the way I, I'd want to save the manifest image if I was going to save <clears throat> the manifest image. I think a better way forward is to ask well, what, what are the arguments for these nihilist, nihilist and abundant theories about composition? Maybe we criticize those arguments. We, we can save the manifest image of, of the self. Now, I mean, for reasons of time and space, I'm going to focus on <clears throat> a very recent argument for compositional nihilism. Okay? I actually am quite attracted to abundance. I actually quite like the idea that there's a composite object for any group of, <clears throat> uh, any group of things whatsoever. But in, in the end, I'm going to suggest uh, a way of sidelining the challenges from both the abundance and nihilist views of, of composite things. But I'll get to that through talking about, about nihilism. Okay. <clears throat> so Ted Sider, in a very recent, possibly not even published officially, paper has given a very interesting argument for nihilism, for the view that there's no such thing as parthood and really no such thing as therefore composite objects at all. <clears throat> and this is, as he puts it, an argument from ideological parsimony. <clears throat> so think of it this way, a theory is ideologically simpler than another theory, just in case it has fewer undefined primitive <clears throat> notions. Now Cider wields, I think, a kind of plausible principle of theory choice. Okay, this is the ep epistemic principle, EP, I put on the handout. So if <clears throat> T1 and T2 are equally compatible with the evidence, and T1 is ideologically simpler, more parsimonious than T2, then T1 is more likely to be true. Right, that's the one we should... If either, we should um, accept. <clears throat> so, I mean, for example, take a theory of uh, me mechanics, lots of kinematics and dynamics, like a kind of Newtonian theory. Uh, <clears throat> maybe like the kind of theory we've got now. But now take another theory, which is like that theory, except it also posits absolute rest, right? The kind of thing that <clears throat> scientists don't, don't really believe in anymore. Well, we should choose this, the simpler one, like the, <clears throat> the more complex theory. It, <clears throat> it has no empirical advantage, right? The simpler theory fits the facts just as well as the more complex theory. So we should choose the, the simpler theory. The theory doesn't posit this notion of absolute rest, which is unobservable and makes no empirical difference. Right, the theory that posits absolute rest is positing superfluous structure in, in reality. We should prefer simpler theories which don't posit superfluous structure. <clears throat> so now take our kind of overall ultimate metaphysical scientific theory of reality. <clears throat> It employs a notion of parthood. I might call that theory T plus. This is on the handout. The T minus is a very similar theory, except it just deletes 
this undefined notion of parthood. <clears throat> well, kind of by, by construction, X hypothesis, the T minus theory is ideologically simpler, it has fewer undefined notions than T, T plus. <clears throat> Next claim, the kind of claim Sider makes, T plus and T minus are equally compatible with the evidence. Okay, and here's, here's a quote, it says, our best theories of fundamental matters, physics and, I say, mathematics and fundamental metaphysics have no need for composite objects. Physics, for example, makes predictions based on laws governing simple entities like subatomic particles. Deleting part of and all reference to composite objects in these theories does not weaken their predictive power. Right? A theory with no parthood, no composites, is just as empirically adequate predictive as, <clears throat> as one which does. So I think it follows from the epistemic principle of theory choice then that if <clears throat> um, one theory is simpler than others and <clears throat> they both fit the evidence, we should choose the simpler theory. That's to say we should choose a kind of picture of reality that doesn't involve parthood or composite objects at all. There are just non-composite atomic elementary particles arranged in certain ways. There's no need to posit composites made out of those things. Why not just stick with, <coughs> stick with the particles? It's kind of superfluous structure like absolute rest or phlogiston or something to posit parthood in addition. So that I think is Sider's kind of argument for this nihilist view that there's no such thing really as, as parthood and hence really no composite objects at all. Okay, can, so can we resist this argument for, for nihilism? <clears throat> well, I'm not going to question the epistemic principle, um, but I'll, I'll just sketch some lines of resistance you might take to actually the, ad, the adequacy claim, the claim that a theory with no parthood, no composites, is <clears throat> fits the evidence just as well as a theory which... Um, <clears throat> fits the evidence as well as a theory which, which does. Okay, so the first one, and maybe you've been thinking of this already, and this connects with Lucy O'Brien's talk last week, <clears throat> there's a kind of Cartesian cogito kind of line of reasoning here. So <clears throat> don't we have, just through awareness of our experience and thought, evidence that's incompatible with the view that there are no composite objects? Okay, so I put a little argument on the handout. So, you know, on the basis of thought and experience, I can conclude, well, I exist, right? I've got that piece of evidence. <clears throat> and I'm a human self. A human self is just the sort of thing I am. Well, a human self is a composite. We're agreeing for now. <clears throat> so there is at least one composite thing, me, and we've agreed that there's no such thing as parthood, there are no composites. So there is such a thing as parthood. Right? There is at least one composite thing, me. And I've got kind of Cartesian certainty of that, right? Because I know that I exist. No, f no clever philosopher is going to convince me I don't exist. Now I think there's actually a good comeback to this kind of argument. And it's basically, Sider gives this kind of argument, but actually it's basically something Immanuel Kant said in his critique of Descartes in the, the paralogisms in the critique of pure reason. The reply basically is that that first premise, C1, is unsupported. When we introspect thought and experience, we're not presented with an individual <coughs> subject that's having those thoughts or experiences. Perhaps in some sense we're aware of a unity of consciousness, right? <clears throat> but for all introspection shows, that unity of consciousness could be due simply to the collective 
activity of lots of little particles arranged in the right way. <clears throat> so introspection doesn't really give us evidence that an individual exists, right? The kind of consciousness and experience that is present could be presented merely to <clears throat> lots and lots and lots of particles arranged in a unity of consciousness thinking kind of way. <clears throat> so I think that's, that's the sort of thing the nihilist should say in response to that kind of Cartesian argument that the evidence isn't equal between <clears throat> nihilist and non-nihilist theories of the world. Okay, but here's another line of attack on that adequacy claim, the claim that the nihilist theory fits the evidence just as well. <clears throat> Even if introspection doesn't present individual objects, an individual object to us, surely sensory perception of the world around us does. Right? When I open my eyes and look around, I see I'm immediately presented with paradigm, individual, unified objects. Okay, human beings, tables, cups, pens, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> well, if that's right, then we just do have evidence that counts against nihilism, right? For example, you know, I've got this table exists. Well, this table's a composite, so there's at least one composite, so <clears throat> there must be such a thing as, as parthood, so the nihilist view is, is wrong. I think there's a couple of replies you might give to this, <clears throat> this argument against adequacy. So, I mean, this gets into very difficult questions about in the philosophy of perception, which I can't really, you know, engage with in much detail here. But one reply you might make is this. Vision, for example, does not immediately present individual <clears throat> unified macroscopic objects to us. Really, all sensory experience, for example, vision presents, is a kind of a, a patterned array of sensation. Right? Really, that's all, that's all that's given in perception. And that, the occurrence of that kind of patterned array of sensation <clears throat> is actually neutral about whether what's causing that patterned array is individual unified composites versus just lots and lots of little particles arranged in the shape of those composites. So actually if you, you know, if you take this kind of view of perceptual experience, then perception doesn't really give us evidence that there are composite objects. Perception just gives us a pattern of sensation which, you know, is neutral as to whether the pattern is caused by unified objects or just lots and lots of particles arranged in the kind of shape of unified objects. Now, I'm, at, I'm, I'm not uh, <clears throat> attracted to that theory of perceptual experience. I'm, at, I'm actually probably more attracted to a kind of naive, realist account of perception according to which the immediate objects of perception just are unified macroscopic holes. But actually, Ted Sider has a very interesting second reply. He actually concedes, OK, maybe, maybe perception does seem naively to present <coughs> composites to us. There's a kind of prima facie conflict with the nihilist view. But his interesting claim is that <clears throat> this apparent perceptual evidence has no force in the present context, in the context of assessing this nihilist theory of reality according to which there are no composites, just lots of little particles arranged in certain ways. <clears throat> what's, his, what's his reasoning here? Well, I, I must confess I haven't quite got to the bottom of his reasoning, but in effect, he asks us to see an analogy right, between the case of 
the apparent conflict between perception and nihilism, and some other cases more familiar in science. So, Sidus has supposed that the naive perceptual appearance of tables <clears throat> as homogenous things is in conflict with the atomic theory of matter, which says that objects aren't really homogenous, solid, they're you know, mostly empty space. It would be kind of very dogmatic and irrational to reject the atomic theory of matter on the basis of that naive appearance. Right? If the atomic theory of matter is a theory we're taking seriously, then actually <clears throat> the kind of evidential force of those naive appearances is, what is zero, he thinks? He thinks taking seriously the atomic theory of matter undercuts the apparent perceptual evidence that things are really solid. Right? We, can't <clears throat> we can't take seriously that, those naive appearances once we take seriously the atomic theory of matter. And he thinks it's just the same in the present case. So although naive perceptual appearances seem to present to us individual unified composite things, in the context where we're taking this nihilist view seriously, the evidence is completely undercut, right? <clears throat> Just looking and saying, well, look, there's a table, a single unified thing, has no evidential force at all against nihilism. <clears throat> and it's quite hard to discern the principle underlying his reasoning here. It's something like if a theory is being taken seriously, then it undercuts the kind of naive evidence to the, to the contrary. <clears throat> but it seems to me that his analogy with atomic theory limps in a kind of obvious, obvious respect, because the reasons for taking the atomic theory of matter seriously are very much the antecedent reasons for taking it seriously are very much stronger than the antecedent reasons for taking compositional nihilism seriously. So <clears throat> the atomic theory of matter, <clears throat> adopting that theory allowed us to explain otherwise inexplicable phenomena. It allowed us to make new predictions, which otherwise had not been available to us. You know, for example, you know, Rutherford, Rutherford scattering and that, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but adopting compositional nihilism seems not to <clears throat> give us any explanation of hitherto unexplained empirical phenomena. It doesn't allow us to make any new predictions at all. <clears throat> so it's hard to see that we should take it antecedently quite as seriously as the atomic theory of of matter. <clears throat> Nihilism does have, let's suppose, this advantage that Sider says it has, which is that it's, even if it has no predictive or explanatory advantage, it has this parsimony advantage. It has this advantage that it's extremely simple. It's more simple than the alternatives. I think the question is whether <clears throat> mere ideological parsimony or simplicity of a theory, is that enough to undercut naive appearances to the, to the contrary? And Sider seems to think that it does. Things he says suggest that. But that, that strikes me as actually an, ins an insane thing to think. Um, and here, I mean, here's a kind of parody or analogy. So consider not compositional nihilism, but a more extreme hypothesis. I've called it extreme nihilism. So extreme nihilism is the view not just there are no composite objects and no parthood. There are no particles either. There's no space, there's no time, and there are no experiences. In fact, there's no concrete world at all. <clears throat> well, here's a kind of argument to believe, for us to believe that position. 
Well, extreme nihilism fits the evidence that doesn't naively beg the question against it. Okay? So the only evidence that doesn't kind of beg the question against extreme nihilism would be you know, propositions about mathematics and logic, which don't just assume that there's a concrete world. <clears throat> so extreme nihilism fits that restricted, neutral evidence just as well as hypotheses which say that there is a concrete world. Moreover, extreme nihilism is ideologically exceptionally parsimonious, even more so than compositional nihilism. Not only does it not posit parthood, it doesn't posit charge, space, time, experience, appearances, consciousness, nothing. <clears throat> well, if it, if it fits the neutral evidence just as well, and it's simpler, then we should believe that theory. We should believe there's nothing, there's no concrete world at all. There's no physics, no experience, nothing. If there's anything, there's just kind of some platonic truths of mathematics and logic, and, and that's it. It seems to me that's something that's gone seriously wrong, <coughs> right, with that, that reasoning. It seems to me what that shows is that superior ideological parsimony of a theory all by itself cannot really be enough to undercut apparent experiential evidence to the contrary. <clears throat> so actually, I don't think that's... I think there are problems with that second reply to <clears throat> the argument that perceptual evidence, uh, the nihilism's incompatible with perceptual evidence. Right? Side is asking us to kind of retreat to some neutral evidence which doesn't kind of obviously contradict <clears throat> nihilism. But if you reason in that kind of way, you end up convincing yourself you ought to believe some kind of very wacky, cranky hypotheses such as you know, there's, there's nothing at all, there's no concrete world at all. <clears throat> okay? Maybe the first reply can be made to work. Maybe, maybe it could be argued that experience doesn't really even give us, um, even seem to give us macroscopic things. It just gives us sensation or something. So I don't want to say that it's clear cut that the perceptual evidence is against <clears throat> compositional nihilism. Okay, but here's a third kind of line of resistance. You might take in particular to, to the adequacy premise of Sider's argument for compositional nihilism. <clears throat> it seems to me that a kind of total theory of the world, which did without macroscopic objects like organisms, or just higher level objects than individual particles, like molecules, cells, organisms, societies, economic systems, planets. <clears throat> the theory of the world that didn't acknowledge those things would be explanatorily extremely impoverished. Because if you notice Sider's defense of adequacy, he just talks about physics. His physics doesn't need composite objects. But what's so special about physics, right? We've got lots of other broadly scientific <clears throat> frameworks for explaining the world around us, you know, biology, chemistry, economics, astronomy. These give us very good explanations of what's going on in the world around us. <clears throat> so on kind of, <clears throat> you know, the principle that we should adopt theories that explain the phenomena well, we ought to um, <clears throat> acknowledge macroscopic objects, even if they're not needed in physics. What are sometimes called the special sciences, the kind of higher level sciences, do you need them? You might ask, well, could, could explanations just in terms of indivisible microscopic things 
do just as well for explaining kind of high-level phenomena in the world. I think it's philosophers have come round to the idea that actually microscopic explanations of high-level phenomena are, are often terrible, actually. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, why is there a human-shaped cloud of people before, of, <clears throat> of particles before you right now? Well, here's, here's one kind of explanation. So, you know, many months ago in my office, there was a cloud of particles arranged human-wise, and if you actually trace the position and momentum of all those particles and all the background microphysical conditions through time, you know, that will explain why there's now this cloud here. <clears throat> well, that's, <clears throat> that's actually arguably not the best explanation we have of why there's <clears throat> someone, someone here right now. Okay, so a better explanation is, well, Anthony emailed me asking me to <clears throat> you know, give, give a talk on this date and knowing that right, that truth of as it were high level common sense psychology which assumes there's such a thing as the, the subject <clears throat> of thought and experience that gives us a much neater explanation of why now <laughs> in front of you many months later actually miles distant from <clears throat> the original events. There's someone right here, right now. So explanatory frameworks like common sense psychology seem to latch on to extremely useful high-level patterns in the world which are kind of invisible at the microphysical level. <clears throat> so maybe if we you know, expand our notion of what should be in our best theory of the world to include kind of special science phenomena, then <clears throat> we no longer should think that a nihilist theory will be just as good fit with the evidence as a non-nihilist theory. And I think there's actually a reply nihilists can make here. <clears throat> so I think they might concede that microphysical ideology and concepts are not necessarily the best or only explanatory tools for explaining the world. We do need some kind of irreducible um, macroscopic vocabulary you know, like belief and desire and organisms and planets and <clears throat> that kind of thing. <clears throat> But they'll say this doesn't commit us to the existence of composite objects. Right? Wherever you've got it, it seems like you're positing a macroscopic composite object like a human being. We instead <clears throat> replace mention of human beings with a primitive predicate of lots of things arranged human being wise, where we cite you know, the beliefs and desires of an agent. <clears throat> We replace that with particles arranged, believing wise, or arranged intending to give a talk wise. So <clears throat> we do have to, let's agree, admit that we need some high level, high level special scientific vocabulary, right? But that doesn't yet commit us to <clears throat> the claim that there are composite objects of those high levels. We can just say they're high level patterns in the plurality of little particles. That's all that exist. It's just we can't really describe those high level patterns in purely microphysical terms. Let's agree, we need, we need to use some irreducible special science vocabulary to, to capture that macroscopic structure. Um, it seems to be that kind of way of defending the adequacy of a nihilist theory of, of the world kind of seriously weakens the argument from ideological parsimony, right? So even if the theory does without this notion of parthood, 
it still needs <coughs> a, a very an indefinitely long, large list of undefined primitive <coughs> notions corresponding to notions used in, in the special sciences. So actually, the nihilist theory becomes kind of vanishingly more parsimonious than a theory which just straightforwardly posits the macroscopic objects that the special sciences seems to, well, does posit. <clears throat> so it seems to me that Sider's argument from ideological parsimony for nihilism is pro problematic, right? There's some serious questions about whether the perceptual evidence doesn't count against it. <clears throat> there's serious questions whether once we had recognized that there's high level explanation in the world, the, th the nihilist theory is still ideologically more parsimonious than in any significant way than um, <clears throat> a non-nihilist more kind of commonsensical theory. Okay, so I don't think I've got an argument against nihilism anywhere there, but I think we weaken the argument that Sida gives for nihilism. Now there might be, there might be um, other arguments for nihilism I haven't considered. And remember there's also this <coughs> threat not to the existence aspect of our manifest image, but to the sparseness aspect, right? This, the, I haven't addressed the abundance theories of composites. It says not that there are none, but there are lots and lots. But I want to close just by <clears throat> suggesting a way of sidelining the challenges which the, the two challenges posed by compositional nihilism and abundance. That's to say, I want to suggest a way in which we could actually just accept one or other of nihilism or abundance and still preserve the manifest image of the self. <clears throat> so you notice when I first asked the question, could we immunize the manifest image against these two threats? I said, so, well, we could, you know, we could deny one of the presuppositions of <clears throat> that gets both of the threats going, that we're ordinary material objects at all. Maybe we could say that we're immaterial objects or we're kind of weird material objects of some kind. But there was another presupposition that was needed to get both of those challenges up and running. And that was claim two <clears throat> on the first page. That's the claim that ordinary macroscopic material objects are composites. That's to say that they are things fundamentally characterized in terms of parts. And I think that <clears throat> a promising line of investigation is actually whether we might deny that premise. Ordinary macroscopic objects are not fundamentally characterized in terms of their parts. Well, how, how do we then characterize fundamentally an ordinary macroscopic persisting thing like a, a cat or a human being or a tree or whatever. <clears throat> well, I think we could just think of such things as enduring individual subjects of the kind of activities which are mentioned in these high-level explanatory predictive systems that we have, such as common sense psychology, biology, <clears throat> and the rest. For example, it, we might say a human self is not fundamentally a composite of parts. That's not what's metaphysically interesting about it. A human self is <clears throat> fundamentally a persisting subject of yeah, the various kinds of activities mentioned in common sense psychology, biology, microeconomics. <clears throat> so just deny the presupposition of the whole thing that ordinary things, the ordinary objects of experience and thought around us are fundamentally 
to be characterized in terms of parts. <coughs> so actually that stops both the challenges from abundance and nihilism in their tracks. Maybe nihilism's right that there are no composites. There are no things which are fundamentally characterized in terms of parthood because there's no such thing as, as parthood. But if ordinary macroscopic things are not composites, if they're not fundamentally characterized in terms of parts, then it doesn't matter if there's no fundamental notion of parthood. <clears throat> Likewise, if we deny that uh, you know, a human self is just a composite of humanly arranged parts, then <clears throat> admitting that there's lots and lots of composites of humanly arranged parts does not imply that there's lots and lots of human selves there because a human self isn't just a composite of <clears throat> humanly arranged parts. <clears throat> so I think by denying that presupposition of both challenges to the manifest image, <clears throat> uh, we can immunize the manifest image and actually be quite happy with either of abundance or nihilism. Okay. Just let me clarify what I'm what I'm saying here, you might think, well, hang on, this is crazy. A human, a cat or a human being, surely they do in some sense have, have parts, right? Aren't they, com aren't they, com they are composites, aren't they? Well, <clears throat> I think it's true that a large scale object like a cat does stand in various relations to smaller things in its path. You know, organs and cells and subatomic particles. <clears throat> Those relations include you know, spatial containment, um, certain relation, causal relations, property determination relations. But we don't need a fundamental notion, parthood, <clears throat> to connect up those things to the macroscopic things. Maybe there are entities which are fundamentally characterized by parts. You might call them, you know, sums or fusions or something like that. In, in the same way, a set is fundamentally characterized by the notion of membership, the notion of membership. Maybe there are things which are fundamentally characterized by relations to parts. We call them you know, sums or fusions. <clears throat> Maybe there are lots and lots of those wherever there's a human being or a cat. <clears throat> but we don't have to say that an ordinary macroscopic thing is something of that category. We don't fundamentally characterize it by saying it's a thing made up of parts in a certain way. We fundamentally characterize it by saying it's a thing which <clears throat> continues through certain macroscopic activities at <clears throat> a higher level. Right? We can the existence of that kind of thing is not hostage to the fortunes of a fundamental notion of parthood. So actually, we can actually agree with compositional nihilism. There are no composites, there are no things which are fundamentally characterized in terms of parts because there's really fundamentally no such relation as parthood. But it doesn't follow from that. I'm suggesting that we have to say that there are no ordinary things like human beings, cats, trees, tables. Okay, so <clears throat> in that way I suggest that the manifest image of the self, the self as it's manifestly <clears throat> appears to us, has a safe place in contemporary analytic metaphysics. Okay.